thank you for coming and I'm happy so many people are interested in the subject of water and ice. So welcome to the Alba Nova. Um, we live on a blue planet. At least it looks like that we have plenty of water. But uh, with climate change, I think we will have to fight a lot of problems and challenges the next years for many people to have access to clean water. Um, in this picture from NASA, they calculated how much water actually there is on our planet. And if you take all the water, liquid water we have and put it in a sphere, it's just that small. And this is just the amount of salt water and drinkable water. So the amount of, of clean water is even less. But it's interesting if you look in outer space. There are many ice bodies, like uh, the moons um, from Europe and Titan. And uh, recent research found out that uh, it's very likely that just below the surface, there is an ocean of liquid water or liquid salt water. And the amount of this water on these ice moons in these underground oceans is this big, if you put it in a sphere. And the amount of water in Titan is even larger. So if you compare it to the little water we have on Earth, it's quite impressive that it's much more. But if you look at our Earth and, and the water, how does water behave? So in our research here at Stockholm University, we are interested on the molecular level. How does water behave? What's the structure? And how can we understand water? One very strange and interesting property of water is if you cool down water, it shows a maximum density of plus four degrees Celsius. This is very unusual. If you compare it to normal liquids, the shown here in this red line, the which, for instance, ethanol or uh, something else, you, if you cool this down, uh, then it will just increase in density while water has a maximum density here. This gives rise to the fact that we have plus four degrees in winter at the bottom of a lake, so the fishes can survive and we can go ice skating on top of the lake. While in summer, it's the other way around, we have warm water on top, but still we have the cold water at the bottom. Another interesting property and, and opposite to other substances is the fact that the solid phase of water, ice, is less dense than water. If you take another substance, then always the solid phase would be heavier and sink down to the bottom. You might have seen this in school already, <laughs> but just to summarize, this is the phase diagram of water. And it's one of the few substances that on Earth exists in all three aggregate phases. We have liquid water, we have gas phase water, and we have solid phase ice, and all three you see in this picture. However, a normal phase diagram would look like this. If you have another substance than water, you have a positive slope here on the phase boundary between the solid and the liquid states. Water is different in many cases and also here, because if you have water, this boundary between ice and water has a negative slope. And so this is one of the many anomalies and, and properties. And then also, because I will come back to this later, <laughs> I want to remind you that between liquid water and water vapor, we have the so-called critical point. And above this critical point, you have a superfluid water, and you cannot discriminate anymore between the liquid and the gaseous phase. So we will come back to this critical point later. In my talk, I will first talk about a little bit about liquid water and the properties, and then focus more on the solid phase ice. Um, there are, as I said, many different anomalies of water where water behaves different than a simple liquid. For instance, you have the compressibility. If you cool down water already below minus 46 Kelvin, uh, Celsius, sorry, <laughs> it starts to increase. So there is not the usual linear behavior that you would expect for a typical liquid, but it starts to diverge as soon as you supercool water. 
The same is for the heat capacity and also for the thermal expansion. And there are many different theories that try to explain this. One of them connects two different types of liquids. So water at high temperatures, as you, if I go back, at high temperatures, water behaves like a normal liquid. It has the linear behavior in all these thermal properties. But if you have these, these divergence once you cool liquid water, this can be explained by having eventually two different types of liquid structures. One is called high density liquid, it's this one, and one is called low density liquid. And in between you have critical fluctuations between the two, which could possibly explain these anomalies. Of course, there is not only one theory. <laughs> there are many, and they are competing with each other. And so far, there is really no computational model that can uh, describe all the observations we do experimentally. So really, the computational models fail to explain water in, it, in its full properties. Um, so the take-home message here is mainly that there are some models that deal with the fact that we have two different types of liquids, and one of these connects a so-called second critical point. So remember before we saw the first critical point at the water vapor liquid uh, interface, and here we have a second critical point between two different types of liquid. And the question we deal with, does water exist in two different liquid states? I brought some bottles here, you can see. <laughs> but we'll discuss uh, in the talk if this is possible to, to put it in a bottle. So first of all, as you saw, the properties of water strongly diverge as soon as we supercool water. And how can we do that? One option that we do here in the lab is we supercool tiny little droplets, they are in the size of 10 micrometer, and then if they enter a vacuum chamber due to evaporative cooling, they cool down. It's like if you sweat and some of the water goes away from your skin, then you notice it's colder. And the same happens here. And the longer your droplets travel in the vacuum chamber, the colder is the temperature. So we can measure all of these droplets at different distances from this nozzle and we have different temperatures. And then we can probe the structure of these different water droplets at different temperatures. And this is here is shown in a schematic. You have the water droplets and with a high energetic X-ray laser pulse, you can make an image of this one droplet. And how can we do that? So let's come back a bit from the water field and uh, have a look on which X-ray sources we use in order to do our research. Uh, one possibility is to use synchrotron radiation. There are different facilities around the world. I've just put a picture from the two that are closest. One is, of course, in Sweden, in Lund, that's Max 4, and one is in Hamburg, that's DAISY. And the way how they work is you have an electron gun here and then they get into a boost, so-called booster ring and then the electrons get accelerated up to the speed of light almost and then enter the storage ring. And usually an electron wants to travel straight and you have some bending magnets that keep it on a circular ring. And always if these magnets bend the electron, it's emitting light. And this synchrotron light we can use for our research to really investigate the structure of water. Another opportunity is a, a modern facility just uh, invented in 2009 in the US that was built the so-called linear coherent light source. It's in Stanford. And instead of having the electrons in a ring, you accelerate it in a two kilometer long linear and then at the end of this two kilometer long pipe, there you have your experiment. And 2009, it's a quite young uh, method, uh, was built the first one, then there was a second one in Japan, and just two years ago opened the third one. Now uh, is also operating uh, one in Hamburg. You saw it before on this picture, here's written XFEL. It's the European XFEL, and 
on this side is the injection point, and then there goes a tunnel two kilometers below the Earth, where, and after we do the experiments. So inside this tunnel, it looks a bit like this. Um, and if, to get you an uh, impression on how big this facility is, this is a picture from San Francisco Bay Area, and this is the Linac, and this is, for comparison, the Golden Gate Bridge. So it's quite a long way where all these electrons have to travel. And to compare with a normal candle or an X-ray tube like you would have at your doctor's place, the synchrotrons have a much brighter light and these uh, X-ray lasers have even brighter light and small pulses so we can really do exciting science with it and have a femtosecond resolution and observe how the molecules move. But for us, the most advantage in this experiment is that we can do a single picture on a single water droplet. It's just 10 micrometer in size. And we want to cool it down as far as we can. And of course, if we reach these 227 Kelvin, not all of the droplets stay liquid. But since we can do a single picture of a single droplet, we can choose the ones that remained liquid and measure them just before they have time to crystallize. So really this is a very big advantage of, of the method. And we can, as you see here, we have this detector. It's, it's a yeah, flat plate. And this is how the images on the detector look like. And if you have a liquid, you have a disordered system, then you get a very smeared, smooth ring on your detector. While when you have a crystalline solid, you have well-defined positions that repeat, and only at certain scattering angles you get constructive interference and get these black spots. So if you integrate this over the scattering angle, then you get straight lines in the case of a crystal, whereas in the case of a liquid state, you have a smooth scattering pattern. So we can discriminate, is it still liquid or is it all resty crystalline phase? And we are interested here in this region, that's the so-called wide angle scattering, and gives us some information about the structure of the water. But on this detector here, you only see this first ring. So if I go back, this is the first strong ring, you see? And here we have observed it, how it changes with temperature. And the second region we are interested in is the small angle scattering, just at the middle of the center. This will give us an information about, do we have heterogeneities inside our water? So if we have these two liquid structures and they become more prominent and we have critical fluctuations between them, then we should be able to see a small angle scattering signal. If you have a normal signal, um, liquid, like ethanol, this would just be flat. So let's first have a look at the wide angle scattering of water. And um, this is what you get after data procession. You, you get a so-called pair correlation function. It gives you the probability to find the next water molecule at a certain distance. So here, this first peak shows us where is the next water molecule. So if you have a hydrogen bond to the next water molecule, from the center molecule to the next, then this distance is shown here in this first peak. And the distance of the next neighbors here, around 4.5 angstrom, is given in the second peak. And here we have different temperatures between 254 and 366 Kelvin. And you see there is quite a dramatic change if you, if you cool down water. It's not even super cooled, it's just 254 Kelvin. And you have a dramatic change in the structure. So that's the first uh, take home message on this slide is water structure changes if you cool it down. And the same is shown here on another experiment. And the idea is that it goes from high density like water at warm temperatures 
to low density like water at cool temperatures. So what about this small angle scattering signal? I told you that there we could get information about possible fluctuations. And this is a nice example, I think, how scientists have to be patient. <laughs> In this case, our professor Anders Nielsen, because he tried this already in 2009. And of course, during the years, the X-ray sources get better, your equipment get better, you are able to cool down the water further. And you see here, it's just a little bit of change of the different temperatures. But now, in the second experiments, they already managed to go down to 252. And you see an increase in the small angle scattering signal. And now recently, we managed to go down to 230 Kelvin. And then you see a dramatic uh, change in the small angle scattering signal. And uh, we have been able to go down to 270, uh, 227 Kelvin, roughly, and then happened that we didn't expect that really, that the small angle signal starts to go down again. And this maximum shows us that this theory of these two different liquids and the second critical point might be true. It's consistent with the theory. It's not a proof yet, but it's going into the right direction. And we could also extract the compressibility from this data, and they also show a maximum. Um, it's molten already. Wow. <laughs> we, we wanted to bring you some uh, D2O ice cubes, and now, now they disappeared <laughs> because they are molten. But you can still see uh, that the heavy water, here we did some experiments with this D2O heavy water, is uh, not floating like the normal water, but it's uh, heavier. That's why it's, it's not on the surface. You can also give it a round if you want before it disappears completely. <laughs> so let's switch gears and come to the solid state. Um, I will go through what is the normal ice we have here on Earth and are there different forms of ice and in particular I want to talk a bit about amorphous ice because this is where I did my research the last 10 years investigating these amorphous ices. But let's first have a look at the normal ice. Winter is almost over, but you might have observed that there are very different snowflakes appearing sometimes. They can look really beautiful and have a lot of different shapes. And Kenneth Liberich did some pictures of these snowflakes. And it's really nice to see his collection of the different snowflakes. And it strongly depends on humidity and temperature, also the way the snowflakes takes in the clouds. But you see that you need a high humidity and roughly minus 15 degrees Celsius to get these big, nice snowflakes. So if you see them next time, maybe think about, okay, how could they have been made or what was the temperature and the humidity when they have formed? Something all of these snowflakes have in common is the crystalline structure. The crystalline structure of all the snowflakes and all the ice, also if you make an ice cube in your fridge, has always a hexagonal lattice. And something they also have in common, but not necessarily only the hexagonal ice, is that you have one central water molecule, then you have the hydrogen sitting, and they will form two more hydrogen bonds. So you have like a water tetrahedra, and this water tetrahedra you find in, in all of the structures I will talk about later. But on Earth, as I said, we only have this hexagonal ice, and all the different snowflakes are built up like this. And Bernard Fowler formulated the so-called ice rules, and which say, well, a water molecule consists of oxygen and two hydrogens, so two hydrogens have to be adjacent to each oxygen. And only one hydrogen atom can be per bond. So on the hydrogen bond, there is only one hydrogen. 
but nothing is perfect. So also in every ice form, you will find defects. If you have uh, hydrogen less, you have or more, you have ionic defects. And if you have two hydrogens on the bond or none, it's called BRM defects. And due to these defects in the ice, you will have uh, motion and tetrahedral reorientations of the protons and also long range transport. Even in ice at low temperature, you have proton transport due to these defects that is always present in the ice. Let's have a look again at the phase diagram I showed you before. At this corner, we only have 22 megapascal. The phase diagram I show you here goes from 0 megapascal to 400. So the phase diagram you see here is only reflected in the small area at the bottom. If you have a high pressure, then suddenly ice can form different crystalline structures. Here we have ice 2, 3, 5, and they all have a different crystalline structure and a different density. For instance, ice 2 looks like this, and these high pressure ice faces then also would sink in the water glass you see. If you turn now the axis here is pressure and temperature, so in the next diagram I swap the axis and now I have temperature here and pressure on a logarithmic scale and then I have more freedom to put all the ice forms we know. In total there are up to now 18 crystalline forms known, including an empty hydrate and uh, also three amorphous states. They all differ how the molecules are arranged and all differ in their density. And you might question, okay, you can do it in the lab, but what do we need it for? <laughs> well, there is some of these forms we have possibly in outer space, and in particular the amorphous ice, where I will talk about later, um, is most abundant on interstellar dust grains or so. It's not crystalline, it looks really amorphous. We will talk about that later. The high pressure ice phases are discussed to exist in one of the ice moons or several of them. Well, here's a picture from NASA shown on Ganymede and below this liquid ocean that we talked before, you might find these high pressure ice phases. But as I said, I want to focus a bit on this amorphous ice. How can we make amorphous ice? So one way is to start with water vapor. If we deposit water vapor on a cold substrate, it has no time to crystallize. It will form this amorphous ice. And this is also what happens in outer space on these interstellar dust grains. We can start with liquid water, but if you ever tried to cool down water, it will always crystallize. Even if you put it in liquid nitrogen, it will crystallize. So you need very high and fast cooling rates. And people tried many years, and then in the 80s, two groups succeeded to do that. One was my previous supervisor in Innsbruck, Evin Meyer, and uh, 1918, they published a paper that have been able to vitrify water, liquid water, into the amorphous state. And at the same time, Jack Debussy was working to make this amorphous ice for the electron microscopy and uh, he got the Nobel Prize in 2017. And he developed this method further for doing electron microscopy because there you don't want the crystalline ice, you want an amorphous matrix as a background. And in Innsbruck, Erwin Meyer developed further a vacuum chamber. <laughs> um, where you can put a small aerosol inside a vacuum chamber. It's a little bit similar to the experiment I showed you about the liquid droplets. But th these liquid droplets now will hit a very cold plate. First cooled to liquid nitrogen and behind there is a second one cooled even further. And then this aerosol will also freeze very fast and then you can prepare very thick layers of this hyperquenched amorphous ice. In the electron microscope, you have only a very thin layer. You need this, so you have, have to do it that way. But for other methods, 
it's important to have a larger amount of this ice. So this can be done with the setup in Innsbruck. All these two species I talked about have a similar structure, a similar density. It's called low density amorphous ice. But we can also make high density amorphous ice by applying pressure. Um, and how do we do this? We can do it here in the lab. And we have a so-called material testing machine. And the ice will sit in this steel cylinder. Here's just a cut through such a cylinder. In the middle, you have the ice. And then you press from the top and apply some high pressure. And I can give you one of the devices so you can have a look at it. It's in principle quite simple. So you apply a pressure of 1.6 gigapascal. And then this graph you see, this is the displacement of the piston. Once you have the device in your hands, you might understand. You just measure how much the piston is moving. So you know how much is your volume changing of the ice sample. And this is the pressure. And if you pressurize this hexagonal ice, then you see there is a sudden jump above one gigapascal. And this is when the open crystalline lattice collapses and forms this high density amorphous ice. Only if you do the experiment at liquid nitrogen temperature. If you do it at higher temperature, you might end up in the other high pressure ice phases. So if you do this at liquid nitrogen temperature, you notice afterwards there is no crystalline structure anymore. It's an amorphous material, completely disordered. And you can do further annealing at high elevated pressures, go to a little higher temperature, not above 160 because then it will crystallize. But if you stay below 160 Kelvin, it will densify even more. And then it has a density 25% higher than normal LDA. And you can do some more treatment. I don't need to go into detail, I think, today. But there are different substates of this family of high-density amorphous ices. For you, as a take-home message, we have two different types of amorphous ice. One of low-density amorphous ice. The density is similar to the hexagonal ice. And one of high-density amorphous ice. Then we have 1.13 gram per cubic square, which is 20% higher in density than the low density amorphous size. And here you see that in the low density amorphous size, you have four next neighbors in the structure, while at high density, there is a fifth interstitial molecule coming in, but not forming any hydrogen bonds. The question, of course, well, we talked before about do we have two different liquid water? And now we have two different amorphous states. Actually, the whole idea in, in theory, to develop this theory about two liquids appeared when Mishima in the 80s found this high density amorphous size. But many people say, well, maybe it's not amorphous. Maybe it's just some microcrystallines. You put a lot of pressure on this ice, and it will crash and then just be so small that you cannot resolve it. So that's one question we deal with to really think about which experimental tools do we have to prove does, is this related to a liquid state or is it a crystalline state? And then this is summarized in this theory I, I talked about before, which was invented from Peter Poole, Shortino, Gene Stanley, and also Mishima, who did all the experiments in the 80s with the high-density amorphous ice. So you have the low and the high-density amorphous ice. They can be converted into each other, and the phase boundary will continue until it ends in this second critical point that I mentioned before. And what is white here on the map is so-called no man's land, which is simply, it's hard to do experiments there because your sample will crystallize. And uh, so we try to find ways to, to shift this boundary so it will not crystallize or we can measure faster than it will crystallize. And now we might have an experiment. <laughs> do we? <laughs> so,
Can we switch? So we brought some ice that we made in the lab, and it's the high density amorphous ice. And as I told you before, it has a 20 or 25% higher density than crystalline or low density amorphous ice. So maybe you can guess what will happen if we now just let it warm up at ambient conditions. Any ideas? Will it just melt or expand? Yes, I heard it. So this is just styrofoam to uh, get the better focus on the camera. So this is the transformation from high-density amorphous ice to low-density amorphous ice. And then the final crystallization we will not see in the video because it's the same density. So finally it would crystallize and then melt. Do we have one more? We can have a look one more and then maybe you can later after the talk come by and, and have a look. Some, it's, uh, some spare samples we took with us all around the world to the different facilities and now with the rest we can do funny experiments for you. Okay, maybe we switch back once yeah. more. Can you keep three? Okay, here we go. So I talked a lot about amorphous ice. What is amorphous ice or what is a glassy state? Maybe we should think about that once more before we look at the experiments. If, if you have a liquid state, just a general liquid, doesn't matter which, and it crystallizes, that's one option. But if you carefully cool it down, you can super cool it, so the entropy will change sooner or later it will fall out of equilibrium and form a glassy state. And this point here where all the molecules get arrested is called glass transition. The, if you make a snapshot of your liquid and the glassy state, it will look identical. So a snapshot of the two states look the same. But of course, in the liquid phase at high temperatures, the molecules can still move, they are mobile. Whereas in the glassy state, they are not. It's like a frozen liquid. And if you see here what I said, the entropy changes if you do this class transition. And the, the derivative of the entropy is the heat capacity. So one very common method to, to measure the glass transition is to measure, measure the change in heat capacity. And that's done in a quite simple experiment. Uh, it's called differential scanning calorimetry. And you have like two ovens, or think about two heat plates on cooking plates. And then on one cooking plate, you put a pot with ice, and the other pot will be empty. And then you try to heat up the two plates with the same velocity, so with the same heating rate. And you measure when you, the ice melts, however, you need energy to melt in order to melt the ice. And if you measure what difference you have in the energy in order to heat up the plates and keep them at the same temperature, this gives you, you the signal. And this is what you see here. If you heat up the ice, you get an endothermic peak on the melting, while if you crystallize water, it's the exotherm, heat is released. A glass transition is not a phase transition in the thermodynamic sense, so you have neither exo nor endothermic events, but you have measure a change in heat capacity. And um, yeah, I showed that before. Austin Angel 
is really a pioneer in this glass uh, science and did over 40 years many experiments with many different glass formers. He measured here the change in heat capacity for, for different glass forming liquids. You have ethanol, glycerol, and he also categorized them by measuring the viscosity over the temperature. Of course, people tried also to measure now the glass transition in these amorphous ices. The problem is we are always limited by crystallization and we can only measure in this tiny range of the initial, the onset of the glass transition. And if I talk later about ultra viscous water, then the viscosity of this water is very high. It's not a liquid as, as you would expect here. It's, it's even slower than honey would fall off from a spoon. It's really very viscous. And uh, if there would be a glass transition, then you would see a change in heat capacity, but we are limited by crystallization in the normal standard laboratory experiments. And again, Erwin Meyer in Innsbruck did this experiment with low density amorphous ice and he was able to see an increase in heat capacity, but this is cut by crystallization and this of course caused a lot of discussion in literature, still discussing is it a liquid, is it a crystal? And also Erwin had to be patient for another 20 years <laughs> and then we, we did the mes measurement on high density amorphous ice. And as well have seen an increase in heat capacity. But how can we use now X-rays to investigate this amorphous ice? Well, as I showed you before, we have an X-ray beam coming in, it hits the sample and then it gets scattered to our detector. That's how the setup <coughs> at one of the beam lines look like. And then the three different amorphous states really give us different structures and uh, different scattering patterns. I will skip that maybe. Here we investigated some substates of different types of these high density amorphous ice family. And you see if you put it on the table, it would always look, look the same for us with the eye. But with the X-ray we see more. And then some of these substates transform like in a continuous manner. And some of the substates will transform more like a first order like transition. And they also have different thermal stability. So we can choose now from all what we know from the experiments, which substate is the best to really investigate this possible class to liquid transition. And here is also another high resolution X-ray data on this transformation. It's exactly the same you saw before on the paper. You start with the blue state, this is high density amorphous ice, and then it transforms to low density amorphous ice. But still we don't know if it's liquid. As I said, the structure will look the same for a glassy state and a liquid state. So we need to find another tool, and this is a method, a quite young experimental method as well, called X-ray photon correlation spectroscopy. And with a coherent X-ray light, you can scatter on this amorphous disordered structures and then resolve not only this ring, but also the so-called speckle pattern. And from, if you do many of these pictures, and you observe the intensity of one of these speckles over time, this gives you uh, relaxation time. Since oxygens, uh, no, <laughs> since X-rays are scattered on the electron cloud of your molecule, they are mainly sensitive to the oxygens. So now we have a method to potentially see if the oxygen is moving during our experiment. And that's what, what we did here. And just to show you the results, these are the correlation times with temperature. So if you heat <coughs> the amorphous ice, then you see there are two different timescales appearing. 
the split of these processes is exactly where we saw before with the calorimetry, uh, the onset of the glass transition. So the increase in heat capacity is exactly around 110 Kelvin. And then everything gets faster once you warm up your sample. And we could also derive diffusion coefficients that clearly indicate that this might be a liquid state and not a solid crystalline state. And from this we uh, have a good indication that indeed the high density amorphous ice first trans because the diffusion is so fast, first transforms into a high density liquid state and then the diffusion is still fast so it transforms into the low density liquid state. It's consistent with the theory I've shown you before, but still not a proof. So we have ongoing research to, to investigate this further with other methods, also including the free electron lasers potentially being able to heat faster and, and to measure faster before it crystallizes. So as a summary, I will, would say, <laughs> keep in mind, there is not only hexagonal ice as we have here on Earth. There is also 20 different uh, states of ice, both crystalline and amorphous, that we can make in the lab, but eventually also find in outer space. And uh, we have good evidence that the two amorphous states, low density and high density amorphous ice, convert to each other and at high enough temperatures undergo a liquid-liquid transition. Also remember that water can be supercooled down to 227 Kelvin. That's the world record so far. And uh, it's consistent with some of the theoretical models, but we have to do further investigations. Let me thank our, our group, my colleagues Marjorie and Alex, who helped me today with the experiments, particularly also Anders, who the group leader here at Stockholm University, Lars, uh, is, is head of the theoretical group. They do all the simulations and wait for the results from the experiment, <laughs> if it's this or the other. And here are all my collaborators. Yeah, I, I work on this amorphous ice since 10, 15 years already now, and um, a lot of people have been involved in this. And let me thank uh, the Ragnar Soderberg Stiftung because uh, they just gave me uh, big grant so I can build up my own research group and hopefully find some answers to the questions I told you today. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, unfortunately there is the light, I can't see. Heavy water? I wouldn't drink it. Yes, it's not good to... <laughs> no, you shouldn't drink it. <laughs> Any more questions? As I said, after the talk, you can also come to my colleague Marjorie. She has some more samples <laughs> to look at the transition. Are there any practical applications for this amorphous ice? No, we, I mean, we, re, we are just interested on the basic research to understand water. Um, what you can think of where it's really important. I mean, you have water involved in any biological systems, and if you have a confined um, membrane, for instance, then it looks like this water is more like the high-density liquid water. And if you want to model any system where water is involved, it's important to know what you put in your model. So we really want to understand water on a molecular level to get information for any other systems where water is involved. One more question. Is there 
Any other liquid with this, such uh, mysterious properties? No. no. That's an interesting thing. There are a few that mm, show uh, this um, two states, but they all be had. Water is really anomalous in, in all these uh, properties, yes. Just a moment, please come into the mic because then we get it also on the. Okay. Is there a water form called poly water, maybe? <laughs> I read about. Um, it has been discussed in the, I think, end of the 80s. There was a publication about poly water when just the discussion about low and high density amorphous ice and liquid came up. Um, but yeah, it has turned down and the concept that was discussed there is not supported anymore from most of the researchers, yeah. But in principle, poly means more, so you have still the hypothesis about two different types of water. But the article you refer to, maybe, that this concept uh, is not discussed anymore. More questions, please? Yep. Yes. It's also related to the applications. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's not a very good question for uh, researchers. But um, the way you look through water, can that be used in, in physics, in astronomy? to find water somewhere else? Well, if you, if you have the calculations of how, for instance, uh, Ganymede is, is built off, uh, you need the information from the lab which density, for instance, these different forms of ice have. So you need the laboratory experiments in order to, to have the information, again, that you put in your model. I mean, no one went there and bored a hole, so it's based on, on calculations, yes. Yeah, infrared observations in, uh, of ices in space and of, uh, of um, which give you some um, conclusions about the ices on the interstellar grains. The problem is, of course, that these are, of course, not pure. There are lots of different other substances in there, like methanol and... Um, if nitrogen, carbon monoxide can be in this ice, so you're not really having any pure substances, which makes things more complicated also there in the interstellar medium. But I would like to ask for some more questions, please. Is there any kind of ice which cannot exist on Earth, but can exist on gas giants in our solar system? Well, none of the faces I, I have shown with numbers higher than one <laughs> uh, exist naturally here on Earth. You can only make it um, in the lab, and you need high pressure. And then, of course, uh, if the pressure is high enough, also the temperature can go higher. Yeah, but I'm not sure about the the planets itself. Yeah, because the, because uh, many mo two moons we assume have got um, subglacial oceans. So the moons, Titan, yes. Titan, Titan and uh, Ganymede. And it could be. I mean, if the pressure is uh, is yeah. is enough there, that there are other phases. Fun, but we have not really got a clue how really thick these ices are. They can be anything from 10 kilometers up to 100 kilometers thick. We are not really very sure how thick these ices are on these sub on these satellites. Any more questions, please? Uh, me again. This time, just on uh, on the setup for the test that you had when you were measuring the compression of this water sample in the mm -hmm. press. Uh, I'm curious how you managed to get such a precise measurement. Uh, how did you manage to seal it in this 
with this moving piston. Ah. I, isn't there like metal compressibility? And um, if you have a seal, isn't it compressed? As yeah, well? the metal compressibility of the steel cylinder can be subtracted if you really want to make an um, analysis of the density change. Yes. Um, what we use is a thin indium foil as a container for the water. Um, it's more important to reduce friction, not so much in order to lose the water, because we immediately freeze the water. So everything is pre-cooled, and when you pipette the water into this container, it freezes directly. So it cannot flow out, that's not the problem. But the issue is that if you have pure ice on a steel wall, then you have high friction effects. And to avoid that, we have a thin indium metal foil that serves as a container. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any more questions? I don't see any hands, so I would like to ask you to thank our speaker. And...